Hey there, Mr. Reddit here. Welcome back to another episode of r slash Entitled Parent Stories. Our first story we'll be reading today. My Karen sister demands I buy her a $300 prom dress. After that, time for my own tale of revenge. And after that, I gave you a $50 discount and you're still not happy? Now for every thumbs up this video gets, one Karen does not get to go to the prom. Not like you take me anyways, Reddit boy. So please smash that like button. And if you're new, subscribe and turn on notifications for new stories from Reddit every single day. My Karen sister demands I buy her a $300 prom dress. I, 23 female, have two younger siblings. My sister is 16 and my brother is 14. When my parents had my sister, they approached being a sibling as a job and they stuck with that story for the rest of my childhood. They said it was my job to teach them things, to look out for them, look after them when needed. Then it was help with homework, walk home from school and walk to friends' houses when they wanted to. Then it was my job to plan and take them out for sibling time. It would be my job to always have space and time for them whenever they needed it. That as the big sister, I owed them that, and my siblings were more than happy with that. When I lived at home, they always demanded my time or attention. I had to help with homework every day, and most of it is regular sibling stuff. But they came to expect me to drop everything for them the way a parent might. Like, if they were struggling and I was in the middle of my homework, I had to stop doing mine to help them with theirs. Or if I had plans and they wanted to go someplace, I had to cancel my plans. It's my parents' fault. But more than once, I tried talking to them about how I deserved to have my own life and do my own thing too. And then I moved out and I would get calls all the time from my family about it. Over time, my brother stopped and our relationship got a bit easier, but my sister never changed. She would call and tell me she wanted to stay the weekend with me, or she wanted me to take her to a concert, or that mom and dad told her I was supposed to take her shopping, or that she saw something in the store and I had to buy it for her. I told her twice in the last two years that I was not going to drop everything and do what she wanted and she needed to get better at asking for this stuff. When I spoke to my parents, they said it was my obligation as a big sister to do these things, so they were no help. My sister got invited to some fake prom with her boyfriend because prom wasn't going ahead in her school this year. She calls me and tells me that she needs me to take her dress shopping, that she knows the dress she wants and everything and that I need to bring $300. I tell her no. She ignores me and tells me that they want to stay at my place after this prom and that I need to give her a key to my place to make it easier. I cut her off and tell her no, none of this is happening. She whines and I tell her whining won't change it. She then tells me it's not fair and I owe her this. I snapped. I told her I am not her parent and I don't owe her anything that she does not get to make demands of me because I'm older, because this is not some job like our parents always said, and if she can't accept that, then she needs to stop calling me. I'm the jerk in this situation, according to my parents and sister. Parents read me the riot act, or started to, and I hung up. They are still upset five weeks later. Am I the jerk? Well, who do you think is the jerk, OP or her parents? Please let us know. I wouldn't want anything to do with those folks if I were her. Time for my own tale of revenge. Many years ago, my now ex, wife and I decided to upgrade from the small single story home we were in and find something with more space for us to spread out. We had her teen son living with us, our three Rottweilers, plus I needed a dedicated study for my work. I'm in technology and often work from home. After months of searching, we found our dream home. Beautiful two story, four bedroom plus study with huge amounts of space everywhere. Seriously huge. The laundry was bigger than my bedroom growing up. The quality of everything was amazing. Square set walls, no cornices, polished tassie oak flooring, floor to high ceiling windows in the living areas, and two walls comprising commercial grade bistro doors that opened up an entire corner of the house onto the covered outdoor entertaining area. The standard of the build was no surprise. This was a display home up until it landed on the market. We were to be the first people to live in it. I'm going to gloss over months of detail and pain, but we had problems with the place from day two, literally. On night two, the plumbing under the in-suite shower gave out and leaked through the kitchen ceiling underneath it. A couple of weeks later, during a monster storm, three of the light fixtures upstairs started leaking water. A month later, we noticed rust starting to show through the rendering on the corners of the house. 
There were heaps of smallish, easy to fix problems, but the kicker was that the balcony adjoining the master bedroom at the front of the house actually started to sag down, to the point that it was unsafe to go out there due to risk of collapse. We were mostly amendable and nice through most of this. The vendor, also the builder of course, was a small business and we had no interest in making his life any more difficult than it already was for a small business owner. But conversely, we were pouring a lot of our hard-earned money into the mortgage and we wanted what we paid for. But for his own reasons, the builder just kept making it difficult to get things fixed. There was a seemingly endless list of excuses for not turning up at the agreed times, a non-stop torrent of blame directed at his subcontractors and just plain crappy behavior, like dodging our calls and not responding to our emails. Of course, we started proceedings with our state's consumer affairs department. After all, we were entitled to a seven-year warranty on our new home. But that process takes time. Time throughout which we were forced to endure issues like water leaks, a dangerous balcony we couldn't use, and a whole host of other issues that meant we weren't enjoying our home. There shouldn't have been any dispute about his responsibility to fix these problems. He just chose to be a jerk about it and make us go through the government process, presumably thinking we would give up before he was forced to do anything. At around the same time, we started getting the occasional knock at the door, only to open it and find a couple standing there with a brochure in their hands and our house pictured on the front. The first few of these conversations ended with us politely explaining that this was no longer a display house, it was our home. Without exception, they all apologized profusely and went away. After a month or so of this, I started to wonder, how was it that people still thought our house was a display home? I went looking and discovered that the builder's website still had our address listed for display. Despite repeated calls and emails, they steadfastly refused to remove our address from their website. This irritated the crap out of me. These people would often come knocking on weekends because that's when people go house shopping, right? But our pleas for our builder to update his site simply fell on deaf ears. Enough was enough. An idea had formed. Did I mention I was in technology? First thing I did was scrape their website and set about the task of creating my own version of it using their exact look and feel. I highlighted every single problem we'd found with the place. Every glamour shot was replaced with shots of the exact same feature but showing the problems we had. Rust showing through the rendering, water leaking from the light fixtures, close-ups of the sagging balcony, etc. You get the idea. By the time I was done, I had what I felt was the perfect alternate version of their site. One that highlighted every single defect in the home, as well as calling out all the problems we had in dealing with the builder. I even included testimonials that were simply copies of the BS emails and texts we received from the builder, avoiding his responsibilities and making lame excuses for not fixing our problems. The headline, testimonial, was the one where he responded with, So just don't go out onto the balcony, when I pointed out the clear safety risk it represented. After getting a lawyer friend to check through each page to make sure I wasn't opening myself up to some form of legal action, he helped me change a few sections, chuckling the whole time. I put the site up for hosting on some cheap and cheerful hosting provider Google told me about. Offshore, of course. I also registered a close but not close enough to be sued domain name to reach it. The next step was to create some actual collateral for execution of my plan. After all, there was no point going to all this effort unless I was actually able to direct people to the builder's website. So I took a copy of the brochure for our house that the builder had conveniently left a few of behind in one of the kitchen drawers and set about creating my own version of it. Similar principles as the website, no contact information except the website address, my website address. By this time, I've made good friends with a few of my neighbors and we had taken to sharing a beer or two most nights on our front lawns. And wouldn't you know it, one of them was a manager for a local print shop. Given he already knew what heck we had been through with the builder, he took very little convincing to print off a run of my brochures for me, on beautiful paper stock, nice and glossy, professional. I think it cost me half a dozen beers. Then came the final step in my plan. I waited. I waited for eager couples to turn up on my doorstep, eyes wide open in wonder at the beauty of the home they were going to pay the builder for their very own copy of. For the next six months or so, whenever one of these couples would turn up and knock on my door and explain their purpose, I'd let them know that this model home was selling so quickly that the builder had asked if I could hand out his updated brochure so potential buyers could go online and look up whatever the current display home address was. 
I don't know how many brochures I handed out. Of the 100 my neighbor printed for me, I probably only had two or three dozen left, but I know I also handed a bunch out to maids so they could have a laugh. I'd estimate close to 40 prospective buyers got a copy of my brochure, and I reckon at least 15 to 20 of these came back to thank me for warning them. A few of them had already signed conditional contracts and managed to get out of them one way or another. I don't know what happened to that builder in the end. I split up with the missus not too long after, and she sold the place not too long after that. At the time of writing this, the builder's website is gone. The domain still appears to be registered in the company's name, and their state business registration still appears to be active. As best I can tell, he's no longer at the last known address for the company, and I can't find any mention of the company online that isn't at least six years old. Hopefully, this jerk is out of business now. And hopefully, the few dozen people I helped sidestep the pain of dealing with him were the beginning of the end of his crappy little enterprise. Have you ever bought something from someone and then found out that it was broken? If so, what'd you do about it? Please let us know. In 2009, I bought a gaming computer from a guy off Craigslist. Long story short, I learned my lesson. I gave you a $50 discount and you're still not happy? I used to work at a call center for a large Canadian telecommunications company. They are a service provider for TV, internet, home phones, and cell phones. I was a customer care agent, and at the time, I was working in the end of promotions department. I'd be the person you speak with when your one or two year discount was set to expire. I had been through many different departments before I was moved to the end of promotion team, so I had access to multiple discounts a regular care agent wouldn't have access to because they never changed my authorization when I was moved to the new department. This allowed me to bend the rules quite a bit when it came to renewing promotions for some customers. Now, most care agents have limited discounts they can give. Typically, the system would generate a discount for a customer account based on their tenure and services with us. That's what the company claimed, which I find to be BS, as I've seen accounts that were created back in 99 that would be tagged for only $10 off and sometimes nothing at all, and they would have to pay in market rates. This is where my access level came in handy. If I spoke with a customer who was super polite and gave me no trouble or stress, I would apply a better discount than what was originally tagged, especially if I see they've been with us for years and even sometimes decades. Example, tagged for $20 off, give them $35 or $40 off instead. Now, the company always claimed to keep track if we apply discounts that a customer wouldn't be eligible for, but I think that was also BS because I did this to many accounts and it never came up during meetings with my manager. So one day I get a call, a customer that's been with the company for a year or two. Let's call him Mark. So Mark's promotion is coming to an end pretty soon and he's looking to get a new one and at the same time upgrade his services. He was on a mid-tier TV package and had 500 megabit unlimited internet. If I recall, he was probably paying around $140 per month. He wanted to move up to our highest TV package and our gigabit internet plan which is the highest you can get for both TV and internet with this company. And this said company is not a budget service provider, so typically that combination of products would cost around $180 before taxes, and the price just climbs up depending on how many boxes you have for the TV, if you have a home phone, and if you have any extra TV add-ons. So I tell him I will gladly look into it and place him on hold. Since he was very polite, and I was in a good mood, I was happy to bend the rules for him, especially after seeing he was only tagged for a $15 discount. He had a $25 discount before, so he would have been paying $10 more if he wanted to keep his services the same, and definitely a whole lot more if he upgraded to the highest package. So eventually, I come back to him with a $50 discount for one year. He will still be paying more for making that change, but it's a whole lot better than the $15 off that he was supposed to get initially. Now, all of a sudden, his attitude and tone does a complete 180. He starts getting angry and starts getting rude. He was talking as if he thought I was joking when I said $50 is the most we could give him. He went on a rant about how he's been with us for so many years and how he deserves to pay less than what he was paying before, and on top of that, get upgraded services. I explained that unfortunately, because he is upgrading to our highest packages, that the increase in price is inevitable. I informed him that if he wanted to, the same discount could be applied to his current services and he'd be saving $25 more than what he's been paying. Then he pulls the same card I hear so often, like, well, my friend has that package and is only paying $80. Or, I see newer customers getting it for so much less. 
which in most cases, sure, it can happen. But with the combination of products he has, I know 100% he was just pulling these prices out of nowhere. He got angrier and was demanding that he gets a better discount. And on top of that, he wanted the Crave slash movies slash HBO add-on, which cost $19.99 for free for a year, on top of that for wasting his time. I start to get frustrated and explained once again that it is not something we can do, and the $50 is the best we can offer. He asks to speak to retention, which at the time was the end of promotion department, and I explain that he's already speaking with them. He starts to lose it and says he wants to speak to a manager because he wants to pay what he feels like he should pay based on his tenure, which again was only around two years, which may seem like a long time, but in this kind of industry, it doesn't really mean much. We do have a dedicated team of managers that take calls when a customer is getting crazy. Their primary goal is just to defuse the situation, but they are not there to give better discounts if we already went through the best options, and they always made that very clear. I explained that a manager cannot provide a better discount, but I can still transfer him to one, as it is a company policy to get them to a manager if they request one, no matter what. So I place him on hold, and what we do is speak to the manager on the line first to explain the situation and the options we as an agent went through before escalating, and then they take the call from there. Usually you're supposed to disconnect from the call once you patch the customer through, but sometimes I like to stick around and mute myself just to listen to the manager tell the customer the exact same thing I already told them. Their reactions are usually priceless. So I explained to the manager, we'll call him Fred, that I had already offered the customer a way better discount than what we had before. I was worried that they would question why or how I gave them more than what we were tagged for, but this manager didn't seem to care. I explained how he had wanted to pay less than what he used to pay while upgrading to our highest package and now on top of that have a $20 add-on given to him for free for a year. Fred scoffs because they understand how ridiculous that was and told me to patch him through. I add Mark to the call, introduce him to Fred, and explain that they will take the call from there. Now, all of a sudden, he's acting very polite again and says, Oh, thank you so much, OP. I hope you have a good rest of your day. Take care. And continues this act while he talks to the manager as if he wasn't just screaming at the top of his lungs at me moments ago. I stick around to hear the conversation play out. Fred does a quick rundown of what Mark was asking us to do just to make sure nothing was missed, and Mark says, yup, that all sounds right to me. Then Fred pretty much tells him what he is asking for cannot be done, and that I had already offered the best discount we can provide and explained that most customers pay way more for what he is being upgraded to. He starts getting angry again and starts yelling that he is being mistreated as a long-term customer and is threatening to cancel all of his services with us and move to a competitor. Fred says he's sorry he feels that way and that if he would like to, they can start the cancellation procedure for him. Mark had had enough and hung up right after. I got a kick from hearing that and went on with my day. A month goes by. I'm taking calls and having a good day. It's slow, not a lot of callers, but the ones I do get have been very nice. And suddenly, a call comes in. The account pops up, I do a quick look over the account summary and see the customer's name. It looks familiar. I check the account's previous interactions and see mine and Fred's from a month ago. A big smile goes across my face as I am speaking to none other than Mark, calling us back again. Now this kind of thing is very rare. With a company this big, we typically have a lot of callers and a lot of employees, so it's extremely uncommon that I speak to the same person more than once. I'm thinking because it was a slow day, they had given early leave to the agents who wanted it, so there must not have been a lot of agents online taking calls, thus having this call routed to me since I wasn't available. I do the standard greeting, thank you for calling, how can I help? But in the inside, I've got a grin on my face because I know he's most likely calling us back because his discount had expired and his price has gone up. He's either calling to cancel or to try and get a discount again. I was right on the nose with that one. He calls, saying that his discount has expired and he's looking to get a new one. Now, Mark didn't seem to recognize that he was talking to me again. He thought I was just a different agent because he mentioned he was given an offer from someone about a month ago that he was looking to accept. Here's where the malicious compliance comes in. As per our last call, you said you wanted a discount based off your tenure. Sure thing. As a matter of fact, the system has already generated a whopping $15 off based on that. I explained that unfortunately, because he's calling after his discount has ended, the original discount we had offered is now expired, 
and now we only have a $15 discount available. He starts to lose it again. Now in some cases, this actually does happen, where if a discount isn't accepted before the other one expires, the new offer also expires and cannot be added. I can agree, it's some slimy stuff that this company does so they can get more money. In this case, because the original $50 discount was never supposed to be given in the first place, I was able to say this and only offer what he was really tagged for. Once again, he begins to lose it. It plays out the same as it did before. I explain that this is the best we can offer. He throws a fit, wants to speak to a manager. Again, managers are not there to apply better discounts. Sometimes we do have something called a documented promise, where if in the notes someone was offered something, say $50 off and it didn't go through, we can still apply it. He could have lied and said he accepted it and it never went through, and the documented promise policy would have made it so that we had to give him that discount. In this case, because Fred and I both wrote in the notes that he declined that offer, it was gone for good. I once again transfer him to a manager and stick around to hear the fallout. The manager did not budge, told him the same thing, that $15 off was the only option, and once again, it ends with him hanging up. I unfortunately never figured out what happened with Mark's account, but here's what could have happened. 1. He's still paying the in-market price for his services, which is a lot more than what he was paying before. 2. He accepted the $15 off and is still paying more than before. 3. He canceled with us and moved to a competitor. One less problematic, rude, and entitled customer. Moral of the story, be nice to the person on the phone. If you're nice, an agent will most likely be willing to go above and beyond for you. If you're a jerk, in my case at least, I'm doing the bare minimum for you and definitely will not bend the rules for you. Again, most agents can't do that anyways, and in this case, I had access to these discounts, most likely by mistake. You should still be nice to the person on the other end of the phone, regardless. You want a ticket? Fine, you get a ticket. I work at a big online company that does lead generation for real estate, and prior to lockdown, I was working on our tech support team. But for one reason or another, not relevant to this post, they decided to move me and my teammates to the success team, a similar job but less techy. This happened on March 16th, the day we became work from home. Now, I realized pretty early on that I was never actually removed from any of the support roles access. I could still view things I shouldn't, like, oh say, how many tickets they had open. In my day, we would finish all of our tickets in a day, to the point where we would watch Netflix and fight over inbound calls. At this time, they had over 3,000 open tickets. I'm a very nice person, very customer oriented, so instead of adding to the ticket queue and making the customer wait a month or two for an answer, if they had called into the success team, I would try to resolve their issue now if I could, instead of sending them to the support team like I was technically supposed to for tech support. But not this customer. This customer called in screaming, and I'm good with de-escalation, I am. I tried to explain that I could help if she had let me. I tried to explain that I used to be part of the tech team. Heck, I even tried giving her their phone number because that is a faster way of getting help. But no, she just kept screaming at me to put a ticket in for her because she's having notification issues and she needs a ticket put in because her notifications aren't working. Literally broken record style. Why she couldn't put the ticket in herself, I have no idea. But you know what, ma'am? Sure, absolutely. There you go, I just put that ticket in and I'm sure the tech team will get to it as soon as they can. They were six weeks behind in answering tickets at that point. I have no idea what happened beyond that since it is a fairly big company, but I'm sure she called and screamed at someone else when the ticket wasn't answered right away. Still made me laugh though, because her issue was a fairly easy one to fix that I could actually have fixed for her in about five minutes if she'd have let me. But instead, I did what she asked and put in a ticket. New neighbor walks into our house because she knew previous owner. Cast, we've got me, fiance, my dad, and entitled neighbor. This happened two years ago when my fiance and I bought our townhouse. Here's some backstory. We found a townhouse for sale in a complex. It was in our price range but needed some work, mainly the basement. On the disclosure, the previous owner stated that the basement had flooded a few years previously. However, the basement was carpeted and had never been replaced or cleaned, so it smelled mildewy. The way the house is set up, there are two entrances, the front door and a door in the basement, both with doorbells. The basement was in two sections, an office and a playroom with the outside door. This is relevant for later. Okay, back to the story. 
I took a week off work and my fiance was able to take two days off so that we could start cleaning and prepping our new house. The first full day we had cut the basement carpet out and started scraping the glue off the floor. When my fiance was back at work, I was there alone cleaning. My father is a bit of a handyman and was really excited about us getting a house, so he was going to come down and help us. I was in the basement sweeping and cleaning, and because of the amount of dust, I left the door to the outside open, then went into the office to start cleaning in there, and that's when my father calls. Here is how I remember the conversation going. Me. Hi, Dad. Dad. Hi, kiddo. How's the new place? Me. Need some work. Dad. I'm about to leave here. Do you need me to bring any tools down? I turn to leave the office. Me. No, I don't think so. Oh my goodness, who are you? There in the middle of the other section of the basement was a strange lady just standing there looking slightly disgusted by the mess. I nearly dropped my phone from the shock of a random person in my house. Entitled neighbor. I'm entitled neighbor. I live in the unit over there. Me, still in shock and extremely confused. What are you doing here? I knew the previous owner. I don't say anything. You know you shouldn't leave this door open. Squirrels can get in. She then walks out the door, closing it behind her. I'm still in shock and looking like a trout with my mouth open. I snap out of it when I hear my dad still on the phone. Hello? Is everything okay? Me. I think I just met our neighbor. My fiance and I had a good laugh about it later. Edit. Here's some more backstory about the previous owner and people in the complex. There were three units for sale and we picked one that was in our price range and we liked the size too. One of the other units was Squirrel Ladies and from what I was told by the HOA, she has since retired and moved to Florida. The other couples that were selling their unit were very nice and have also moved. But before they left, they told us that the previous owner was not well liked and was a total Karen. Her only friend was Squirrel Lady and they had both been living here for over 15 years. No, I don't think the previous owner moved because people didn't like her. She was at least 80 when we met and the townhouse has two flights of stairs. Her being fed up with the place is probably why she shouted, I'm done, and ran out. And strangely enough, Squirrel Lady was right. We did end up having problems with squirrels. We even got a flying squirrel in our house once, but that's another story. I didn't know I'm not supposed to work here. This happened two years after I arrived in the USA when I was 14 or 15 years old, sophomore in high school, so I'm trying to adapt myself to the new country. One of the issues that I'm facing back then is understanding places and locations. Also, this was back when there was no such thing as Google Maps, only Quest Map, where you have to print and carry with you everywhere, and I have no cell phone yet. My high school divides their grades into five sections, such as 10A, 10B, 10C, 10D, 10E, and the same thing for freshman, junior, and senior. One of the purposes of this was to make career development day easier. In a specific day of the week, the school sends a bunch of students to their specific location outside of the school for the whole day in accordance to their section to learn about different careers and make a short story about what you've learned. For example, A goes to their locations on Monday, B on Tuesday, and so on. The purpose of Career Development Day is for students to go to the locations designated by the school and to shadow employees there so the students can write a report of what they've learned about specific careers. I didn't go to this school for my freshman grade, so I didn't know what career development was. However, I was a very shy kid, being new in the USA and all, so I didn't ask too many questions and just went along with it. When I received my roster for the year, I also received the address for my career development location for the year as well. I went to enter the address into MapQuest and printed it out and I didn't realize I switched the number. For example, what's supposed to be 1333, I typed in as 3133. The first day of my career development day of the year, as expected, I went to the wrong address, which was a USPS warehouse. When I came into the facility, I was so confused and so was the rest of the staff there. I didn't see any other students and my teacher wasn't there as well. I tried to explain with my sort of broken English that I'm here for my career development day, showed the logo of my school on my uniform, and being extremely nervous. I think they understood what I was trying to say because the next minute I was being put into work. It was super easy, just sorting mail, very mundane work. Career development day was supposed to last half a day, from 9 a.m. to 12.30 p.m., and then I go home. I started at 8 a.m. and sheepishly told the staff that my school dismissal time is 2.30 p.m., 
They were really nice, bought me lunch, a drink, and told me that I was a good helper. Also, they wrote a letter mentioning about what I had done the entire time I was there and gave it to me so I could show it to my teacher. The next day, I was being called to see the career development teacher. Turns out, I was marked absent for the day since I didn't show up and nobody called the school to find out where I was. The funny thing is, the school didn't contact my parents to find out where I was as well. I showed the teacher the letter I had received from USPS staff and after reading it, my teacher laughed until tears came out of her eyes. I was very embarrassed, but at least the teacher understood, forgave me, and removed my absence. She also pointed out that I was at the wrong address and printed me the real directions. I wish smartphones were invented back then because I clearly was not smart. Let me answer some of the burning questions here. 1. Did I end up working at the USPS? I did not. I'm the typical I don't know what to do after high school type of person, so I was working on random jobs while in college, taking random classes. The thought of starting my career with the USPS didn't even cross my mind. 2. How's my English? It's getting so much better, thank you. This happened in 2005, so in 16 years of living in the US, I've had a lot of time to practice more. Still not perfect, still have a tiny bit of an accent, but at least I'm more confident now. Come watch this video next, you will love it. Join as a channel member today and we'll give you a shout out in our next video. And did you know you can have us make a video for you? Head over to our Fiverr, link pinned in the comments below.